、生物学の,あの学生の皆さん、えー、授業を使い,いただいてありがとうございます。えー、今日あの、えー、講演をお願いしたドクター・クッシュマンは、あの私がポストクでも12年前にお世話になった先生なんですが、えー2008年に一回出して、でもう一回また今年、えー、出してくださることになりました。で、えっ、ー、と、ちょっと、汚い英語ですが、最初に、えー、彼の紹介を英語にしたいと思います。It's my great pleasure to invite Professor John Cushman and his wife, Mary Cushman, today. I really appreciate that they took the time to visit here. And a very tight schedule in Japan. Now, I would like to introduce Professor Kushman from the University of Nevada, Reno, as a today's speaker. Professor Kushman、uh, received his PhD degree in 1987 from Dutgas University, New Jersey, for his research on the organization of genes. u g r e e n and Kronplas gene. Then he moved to the University of Arizona to work as a postdoc in the laboratory of Professor Hans b o n a r d Professor Kushman started his studies on stress responses of higher plants, <coughs> including a r t h o p s i s and also a s p a n t Based on his excellent r e p e r t o r e he obtained Uh, an assistant research position in、uh, 1992 Oklahoma State University. He was promoted to associate professor in 1998, and in the year 2000, he moved to the University of Nevada. <laughs> and he was promoted soon to.、Uh, Full professor in 2003. He is now doing research actively on stress tolerant mechanisms of a wide variety of plants, including insurrection plants, that is today's main topic. Now, without further delay, I would like to call upon Professor Kushman. The title of his talk today is. Reading the dry drive, the metabolic basis of desiccation tolerance in the selection plant.、So, uh, Professor Kishman, please. All right. Well, thank you,、uh, Shin, for the kind introduction. And、uh, it's really a pleasure、uh, to be here again. And I thank you all for coming. It's a pleasure and an honor for me. I was、uh, visited、uh, Saitama. Uh, in 2008, and some of you may remember my talk back then, that's four and a half years ago. I spoke on c r e s t l a c e a n acid metabolism.、Uh, and that's a stress adaptive、uh, adaptation, a metabolic adaptation to、uh, water deficits in plants. And we live in、uh, Nevada, which is a very dry state in the western United States, and、uh, we receive 180. Millimeters of precipitation a year. That's about seven inches of rain. So it's a very dry desert. And so, consequently, all of our research activities associated with agriculture are、uh, in our department, in our university, are associated with topics that look at drought, heat, cold adaptation, or adaptive responses in plants. And one of the major goals that we have. Uh, is to do basic research that will then inform strategies,、uh, novel strategies, to develop more drought tolerant plants, more heat and drought and cold and、uh, salt tolerant plants. So, the, the, one of the research topics that we are working on is the, the, a very in, an interesting set of plants called resurrection plants. And, Uh, these get their name、uh, because they can、uh, be dried out. All of their vegetative tissues can be dried out. But then they can, once you、uh, rewater them, they can come back to life. They can resurrect.、And、so that's where that name comes from. 
So what, uh, what I'd like to cover today in my lecture is just to first define what desiccation tolerance is and how that actually differs from drought tolerance, uh, which you're all familiar with in uh, plant responses. Then uh, I'll take you through uh, several studies, uh, one on transcriptome profiling, where we're comparing uh, a desiccation sensitive species and a desiccation tolerant species uh, that are very closely related to one another. We call this a sister group comparison. And I'll explain more about what that is precisely uh, at moderate water potentials. And then I'm going to take you through uh, two other studies where we looked at metabolic profiling in a sister group contrast or comparison at moderate water potentials. Uh, uh, in a species called Selaginella. And then I'm going to have time, uh, I'll take you through a profiling study that we did that looks at very low water potential. Okay? And that's in uh, a different uh, species. Uh, we, we work on uh, a couple of different uh, species. And I uh, just wanted to mention that this work has all been done in collaboration with Mel Oliver, who's at, the, at, at our uh, National Agricultural Research Service and uh, the University of Missouri and another colleague, Robert Sharp, also at the University of Missouri. So what is uh, desiccation? Uh, well, most plants will live in and tolerate water deficits in this uh, minus uh, three to four megapascal limit in this range. And below that, these plants will typically die. They cannot not survive uh, relative water content losses below about 25% or so. Um, or actually, it's closer to about 40%, somewhere on the, on, in there, uh, because it, it differs by species. The lowest recorded water potential is minus 12. That's in Laria. That's a creosote bush that lives in the desert in Nevada, southern Nevada, very hot, uh, dry, plant. And then there are, it's not uncommon for non-vascular species in the bryophytes to uh, survive uh, water potentials down to about minus uh, 40 megapascals. Below this, though, uh, only desiccation tolerant or resurrection plants can survive. And, and these water potentials are basically uh, uh, conditions of air equilibration so that uh, the vegetative tissues of these plants will be uh, uh, completely dry. Okay? But upon rewatering, these plants will be able to come back to life. And so drought tolerance is, is uh, what we're all familiar with. That's uh, tolerance to suboptimal water availability. And there are many well-studied responses to this. In contrast, the molecular basis of desiccation tolerance or this ability to drop, survive and revive from an air dried state where the protoplasm has actually uh, been completely dried out. That, uh, and, and they do this without suffering permanent injury to the vegetative tissues. That has not been very well studied at all, uh, amazingly enough. So we have uh, studied this phenomenon of resurrection plants in a phylogenetic context. So what's shown here is a very simplified version of, of plant phylogeny. And so you have non-vascular plant species down here, the liverworts, hornworts, and mosses. And uh, one of the, the clades that we've studied uh, is the mosses. And <coughs> these are thought to have constitutive desiccation tolerance and repair mechanisms. Uh, beyond that, there are the only other clades uh, that exhibit desiccation tolerance are the selaginellus, ferns, and angiosperms. And uh, I'll show you some examples of these. Uh, and in this case, as you go through from the, the vascular plants, which is here, uh, it's thought that both constitutive and inducible uh, desiccation tolerant adaptive mechanisms come into play. 
Okay, so let's just, I'll just show you an example of this. This is the, the Moss Tortula ruralis, which has been very well studied. It's thought that these plants in the hydrated state have constitutive cellular protection mechanisms. When they dry out, that drying can be very rapid on the order of uh, minutes to a few hours at most. Uh, they are then uh, able to rehydrate and it's thought that, that that rehydration also, of course, would involve recovery and repair mechanisms. Just to give you an idea of how rapid this actually occurs, this is a little movie of, uh, from Mel Oliver showing you this very tiny moss. They're very small. This is a, a, a P1000 pipetta. Uh, you can see that that moss is then being rehydrated. Uh, and within minutes, it will become photosynthetically competent and uh, resume growth. Okay, so this is this is for non-vascular plants. But what about the uh, vascular plants? And so here in angiosperms, it's thought that uh, the uh, there is a great deal of inducible desiccation protection that goes on, and we are familiar. We're all familiar with this in angiosperms, in uh, uh, seeds and pollen. These are plants, specialized plant structures that we are very familiar with that are known to undergo desiccation tolerance. And so this is the orthodox seeds. You can see that all of these structures uh, are able to survive many years in a dry state. However, that's not true of most vegetative structures. However, for the resurrection plants, uh, there are, va uh, there are uh, uh, vascular species which can undergo uh, the drying out of the vegetative structures, the leaves and roots. And uh, I forgot to point out that this, this trait, this resurrection trait, is very rare. Uh, there are only about 350 vascular plant species that have been documented <coughs> that have that trait. That's a, less than 0.2% of all uh, higher plants or vascular plants. So it's an extremely rare trait. So uh, what happens here is that the time frame is much slower, and the drying requires an induction of cellular protection mechanisms. ABA is known to be involved, and then upon rehydration, many complex reestablishment uh, conditions uh, or processes have to come into play. So this is a, a picture of a crowd of stigma, and this is an angiosperm. You see the plants are very, they're, they express anthocyanin as a UV protection and antioxidant protection. And as the plants are watered, the, the leaf structures uh, are recovered and the plants will grow. And notice that instead of minutes, this process takes about 8 to 12 hours. Uh, and even the, the flowers, the, the, the floral uh, structures are able to withstand drying as well. It's really quite an amazing uh, species, these Corellostigma species. Okay, and then the, the data that I'm going to show you today is on uh, the Selaginella and another angiosperm species of grass, the angiosperm species. So in Selaginella, this process uh, is intermediate, in, has an intermediate time frame. And one of the Study. One of the desiccation tolerant species that we look at is called Lepidophila, and it's, a, it's native to North America. And this is called a club moss, um, and it has been used for traditional medicine. It, it diverged from uh, uh, the, the angiosperm lineage about 400 million years ago, and it can recover from desiccation uh, in, in, uh, within hours. And it can be maintained in this dried state for many, many years. And it maintains the chlorophyll uh, in, in the microfonds uh, or microfills. Uh, you can't see the chlorophyll because the plant curls up into a ball. And this is uh, just to show you this process of uh, rehydration. So here, uh, the study that I'm going to talk about goes from a, a dried state, which is shown here, and get this movie going. The plant is watered. And you can see that this beaker is full of water. And the plant uh, 
uh, opens up, and uh, there it will green up a bit. And uh, as you can watch, the water gets drawn down. And when it's fully hydrated, uh, it, uh, this takes uh, about 12 hours or so to become fully hydrated. And you can see that the, the plant is greening up a bit, uh, becoming photosynthetically active. And then once that water is depleted, right? down here, it's going to be completely depleted in about 24 hours. You can see that it starts to uh, dry out here, and it's going to uh, curl up again. There it goes. And it curls up uh, quite rapidly, actually, uh, within uh, just a couple of hours. It's really quite amazing. OK, so that's the, the whole dry, wet, dry cycle. And that's what I'm going to take you through uh, for uh, some uh, studies that we've worked on. So uh, the other, uh, so the type of study that we've done is called a system group comparison. Basically, uh, this is to study two closely related species within the same genus, uh, one being desiccation tolerant, the other being desiccation sensitive. And the idea here is that we want to compare uh, uh, and find recent changes in function. And if we use a close comparison, hopefully the genetic differences will be small between these two species. And that will allow us, uh, give us an easier time to sort out what the genetic differences actually are uh, responsible for desiccation of tolerance. So uh, what we've done in this study is basically compare the desiccation tolerant species here and the desiccation sensitive species here at fully hydrated state here and 50% relative water content shown here. The reason that we've chosen 50% is if we go much lower, that the this at 40%, it, this that water relative water content is lethal for the, the sensitive species. It will never uh, come back uh, to life. And the this is uh, unfazed. And below this, about 25% uh, uh, relative water content, no bulk cytoplasmic water resides in the plant leaf. Okay? Uh, so uh, that gives you an idea of where, what, where things are happening here. So I'm going to take you through a study where we've compared these two species at 100% and 50%. So the first study that we did was a transcriptome study. And we sampled at 100% relative water content and 50%. And we did this for both species. And we also included a dry sample uh, for just the desiccation tolerant species. And we used Illumina sequencing, uh, which uh, you're probably all, all familiar with. This is a high, next generation high throughput sequencing strategy uh, where you typically get between 8 and 12 million reads in this study uh, per sample. Uh, so we can sample with great uh, depth. And what we found was that the, the desiccation tolerant species, Lepidophyllum, showed uh, more than seven and a half times more genes were affected. About 2,700 genes were either increased or decreased when we compared uh, the 100% to 50% relative water content in the desiccation sensitive species, Molodorpii, uh, only 362 genes were affected. So, and these are only the significant genes uh, at a, using a twofold cutoff uh, ratio between, uh, uh, between uh, the uh, fully hydrated and the fully dehydrated, or the 50% dehydrated state. So that's a huge difference. And the other interesting thing was that we compared the sets of significantly changed genes, either up or down. Only 36%, only 36 genes were shared by these two species. And that's really amazing, because you have to think that these are closely related species. Uh, but they're, they're, in their response to, to dehydration stress, they're acting very differently. So let's look at how differently they're behaving. 
and it's really quite striking. So this is uh, a gene this is a biological network for gene ontology visualization tool that we use. It's called Bingo for short. And what you notice is that it's a, a network and the size of the balls here, and these are gene ontology uh, categories, the, ball, the size of the balls indicate the number of genes which were differentially expressed. The color indicates uh, going from white to yellow uh, to orange. The deeper the color orange, the higher the probability that those differences are uh, indeed significant. Okay, so it's a, it's a measure of probability of significance. So notice that the desiccation tolerant species has a very large and active response. The desiccation sensitive species barely responds at all. Okay. Uh, and th there's very little going on. So what's going on in the desiccation tolerant species? So uh, what, what is shown here is just a close-up uh, response to stress terms uh, using this bingo uh, terminology. And these are a whole variety of things uh, associated uh, with responses to stress, chemical stimuli, uh, response to radiation, light stimulus, temperature, uh, uh, metal ions, calcium. Uh, they're, they're very responsive to a whole variety of things, including uh, UV light uh, shown down here. In addition to those stress responses, the plants are also responding to metabolic processes. And this is a whole host of metabolic processes, uh, uh, primary and secondary metabolism. So you can see that they're very actively altering their metabolism. Okay? And we'll go through what those metabolic changes are here in just a second. And then in contrast, this is the desiccation sensitive species. It's very, doing very little, a very small response to stress, stimuli, some yasmonic acid stimulation going on. But it, in general, very, very weak, weak uh, response. Very little going on. So what are the, some of the genes that are involved in uh, desiccation uh, tolerance? Well, there's uh, abiotic stress-related genes. You see a large number of genes in lepidophila. Uh, and again, almost no uh, genes that were differentially expressed in Molonormia. Leo proteins are early light use proteins or ELIPS. Uh, so LIA proteins uh, are involved in a lot of protective uh, functions. Uh, ELIPS are involved in protection of photosynthetic apparatus. Uh, calcium dependent protein kinases, uh, we're, not, we're not sure what they're doing, but uh, in this, these particular genes, but some of these are known uh, to be involved in antibiotic stress responses. A uh, large number of uh, chaperones in the heat shock family uh, protein uh, heat shock proteins, and these are these have been implicated in previous studies uh, to be involved in uh, desiccation tolerance in addition to heat stress. And our, our study very nicely validates that. Uh, and then we have a whole suite of, of reactive oxygen or RAS, RAS scavenging enzymes uh, listed here. You can see that that's a very dominant group of stress response. Then we also have a whole series of other related uh, 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 genes associated with, uh, for example, trilose, uh, secondary metabolism, uh, uh, degradation of proteome, of the proteome, ABA related, and some secondary metabolism. And you can see that these are very pronounced numbers in contrast, very little going on uh, in Moldorpia. Uh, one of the exceptions was we looked at the transcription factors, and, and these are these are quite comparable in number, uh, but we haven't studied that in any detail, which is, which is kind of interesting uh, that we see these, these differential expression and transcription factors, but it doesn't seem to do all the North County much good. Okay, so just to summarize then the transcriptome comparison, we see that the desiccation tolerant species responds to very large water deficit stress with a very dynamic and large number of gene expression changes. In contrast, seven and a half times more gene expression changes than desiccation sensitive species. And 
the, those genes that are, that are being expressed in the desiccation tolerant species are represented, they're overrepresented for things like the protection of the photosynthetic apparatus, reactive oxygen species, detoxification protein, proteome remodeling, ABA metabolism, and the translational apparatus, and uh, a, a lot of other primary and secondary metabolism as well. Okay, so we'll take a, a short break here. And now we're going to move into uh, exactly what are the metabolic effects. Okay, so keep going. No, no, it's okay. <laughs> All right, I just wanted to take a break uh, just to know that we're going to move now from transcriptomics to metabolomics. Okay? All right. So, why metabolomics? Okay, as you all know, metabolism uh, is the end product of all of the cellular regulatory processes. And it's, there are hundreds and hundreds of metabolites that are expressed, and, and uh, it makes up part of the phenotype of an organism. Uh, some would argue it's an ultimate phenotype. Others would argue that proteome, the proteome is the ultimate phenotype because that's what's involved in making all of the structure and enzy enzymes that go into uh, regulatory factors that go into uh, a cell. However, uh, uh, we can argue uh, that metabolites are also very important. So these are tightly regulated by gene expression and enzyme activity, of course, and uh, many genes encode enzymes <coughs> for metabolism. So uh, it's, I think it's, uh, no one would argue that the metabolome or the metabolism of an organism uh, is a very important way that one can investigate uh, what's going on in that organism. So we use a metabolomics platform that, that uses a combination of three independent platforms, ultra-high-performance uh, uh, ultra liquid chromatography in for basic species and acidic species, and a combination of uh, gas chromatography uh, mass spectrometry. And typically, this platform characterizes 250 metabolites. Uh, and if any of you have done, uh, tried to do metabolics profiling, uh, if you just use, for example, G a GCMS platform, you'll know that you only get about 60 to 70 metabolites out of such analysis. So by using a combination of these methods, we get uh, typically 250 or more. Uh, some of our studies, we've seen 300. And in one study, we got up to 500 metabolites, which is really quite amazing. So again, just to remind you that we're going to compare in this study the desiccation tolerant species to the desiccation sensitive species, and it's we're going to do this at 100% and 50% relative water content. Okay. When we do that, we get about 270 metabolites from Lepidophila, the desiccation tolerant species, and about 265 from Molinorphia. Uh, and uh, a total, if you, if you sum those, the total uh, metabolite, uh, we, we get about 302 different me uh, metabolite species. And these are, uh, this is a very typical profile. You see a large number of amino acids, carbohydrates, including uh, simple sugars and oligo sugars, lipids, and a whole series of cofactors, nucleotides, peptides, and secondary metabolites. Now, what's really striking is, uh, I guess it's not too surprising that in plants, we see uh, a whole, uh, about 40 to 44% of these compounds are unknown or unnamed, which means we have our work cut out for us uh, when, we are, when we're analyzing the metabolome of plants. And plants have a very diverse uh, uh, repertoire of metabolites. Uh, by all estimates, there's something on the order of 200,000 different metabolites in the plant kingdom. Uh, any one species uh, of a plant probably has uh, probably less than 1,000 metabolites, although we don't really know because uh, the methodologies are only, uh, this methodology uh, is really only scratching the surface of the metabolites, I think. Uh, but uh, about 1,800 named metabolites are known or plants right now. Okay, so uh, this is looking at this shared set 
of 199 compounds where they were they were found in both species in both states. Okay, so this is just a comparative analysis. And what we looked at, what you can see here, is lepidophila, uh, and uh, that's the desiccation tolerant species. What you'll notice is that at 100% in red and 50% in green, notice that these are clustering together, which suggests that those two states are probably not too different from one another. That suggests to me that the plant is uh, behaving metabolically. It's, it's anticipating or it's con being uh, constitutively prepared to dry out. Okay? Now, in contrast, we'll look at the response of Molendorfii. Here's 100% and here's 50%. They're very different from one another. Okay? They're not similar at all. Uh, and this is using a partial least squared discriminant analysis. Um, and the other thing is that you'll notice that the two species are very different in their metabolic uh, repertoire. Okay? So let's look at, in detail, what are some of these differences in metabolites and why are they important. So uh, what I'm going to show you is a series of box plots. These uh, are basically the lepidophila will be on the left, the solidarchia will be on the right. 100%, 100% and 50% relative water humidity. Uh, these, these box plots, uh, the line here is the median. This is the upper and lower quartile. Uh, and then the whiskers are the extreme, uh, the minimum and maximum distribution of the values. And sometimes you'll see an extreme data point as an outlier, which is shown here. Okay, so that's what we're gonna look at. And what you'll, uh, we'll, what we'll, we'll look at is a series of, of metabolic uh, pathways. So the first pathway we looked at, at was energy metabolism. What you notice is that sugars like sucrose, kestose, which is fructose of glucose, glucose are more abundant. And these are among, glucose and sucrose are among the most abundant uh, sugars. Uh, the, in addition to triolose, uh, these make up about 50% of the bulk of all the metabolites that we can detect. So those are likely to be important. Notice that triolose is actually lower in the desiccation tolerant species. And if you're familiar with triolose, uh, many people have, have thought that triolose is important for desiccation tolerance. Our data uh, uh, do not suggest that. And our data, uh, because it's less abundant here, uh, the, the desiccation sensitive species actually is more triolose, uh, and that, that sort of flies in the face of conventional wisdom. However, uh, you can knock out triolose biosynthesis in yeast, and the yeast will still be desiccation tolerant. So triolose is not essential for desiccation tolerance, although we think that it's probably helping. It's playing a role, but it's, it alone is not essential. Sucrose and glucose are probably much more important. Uh, we also found that sugar alcohols, particularly in the hydrated state, are very, very important. And this is uh, the, the most important ones are sorbitol, xylitol, and erythritol. And we think that these are uh, slowing the rate of drying or slowing the rate of water uptake uh, so that uh, adaptive mechanisms can come into play. We also know that those three sugar alcohols have, have very strong reactive oxygen scavenging activity. And we also know that sugar alcohols play important roles in the stabilization of membranes and proteins by functioning as osmolites. In addition to sugar alcohols, uh, we have amino acids. Uh, and amino acids, of course, serve as precursors to secondary, many secondary metabolites. Um, and uh, some amino acids, like betaine and carnitine, function as osmoprotectants. And you can see that betaine is more abundant in the desiccation tolerant species here. Uh, and so that's probably very important for the desiccation process. Uh, and so this is, where's betaine? Betaine, there it is, uh, glycine betaine is shown here. Uh, here's triolose, uh, which we don't think is so important, 
and then here's sorbitol. And you can see that these are hydroxylated uh, sugars, uh, and the, 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 these hydroxyl groups are thought to be, play an important role as replacements for water. So let's look at what we think is happening for, uh, during this drying state. So the plant will go from a fully hydrated molecule, so this is a, 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 an enzyme here. It will move to an intermediate state where water begins to be withdrawn. Uh, it's not the full cytoplasmic water loss. It's an intermediate state, so there's still water around. But what we think is going on is that those sugars or amino acids will preferentially exclude uh, uh, the uh, damaging uh, uh, solvating uh, or co-solvents shown here in pink and uh, prevent the protein from being denatured, which is shown here in dark red. And what is happening is that these are maintaining this hydration shell or water shell around the protein and keeping it in a folded state, whereas it moves to an unfolded state here. So the protein is maintained. Now, as you withdraw water completely below that 23% relative water content, what happens is it's thought that particularly sugars, uh, uh, sugars being more important than amino acids, uh, these hydroxylated sugars are repl actually replacing water and will bind directly to the protein by hydrogen bonding interactions. Uh, and they, they are uh, going to replace water. Okay? So, and the other important thing about this is that this process has to be reversible. So imagine that once a protein is denatured, uh, it's denatured. You're not going to be able to recover that protein uh, unless you use uh, heat shock proteins. Some heat shock proteins have that ability. Uh, but for the most part, you're going to have severe damage. However, if you're maintaining the structure uh, in, a de in, a in a dehydrated state, a desiccated state, then it has the potential to go back up and become hydrated and functional again. And indeed, this is well documented. If you take a dry resurrection plant and you were to measure the enzyme activity of any number of enzymes, uh, they are known to maintain about 70% of uh, enzyme activity uh, from the dried state. Uh, whereas in uh, desiccation sensitive species, that, you, that number is uh, very small. Uh, so the enzyme uh, integrity of the enzymes is not maintained in a desiccation sensitive species. Okay, what about the protein? Uh, I mean, what about membranes? Membrane stabilization is a very <laughs> similar situation is thought to occur where you have preferential exclusion or hydration uh, at uh, the membrane surface here, and uh, these proteins, uh, uh, these osmolites, uh, prevent uh, membrane disturbance. You also have in the dried state, uh, particularly sugars and amino acids, and some hydroxylated flavonols have been implicated in uh, preserving the head group spacing uh, and also maintaining the uh, spacing of uh, the lipid, lipid uh, side chains in uh, the lipid membrane. And again, this has to be reversible, uh, whereas in desiccation sensitive species, uh, the membrane is, undergoes severe damage and is uh, unrecoverable once the plant is rehydrated. So, uh, what about some other adaptive uh, traits? So we know that it's not just uh, 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 osmoprotectants that are important. There are many other uh, species that are important. Uh, however, uh, uh, one, one uh, important uh, uh, amino acid derivative that we see uh, is more abundant is citrulline. In contrast, all of these other uh, nitrogen-rich amino acids are more abundant in the desiccation sensitive. So they're probably not important, but citrulline probably is, and that has been demonstrated to have a very uh, active uh, hydroxyl radical scavenger activity. Now, this is really interesting. Look at these gamma glutamyl amino acids. So gamma glutamyl amino acids are dipeptides, and we see a whole uh, suite of these 
uh, being more abundant uh, in both uh, relative water content states. Uh, and what we think these are going on, these are doing, is that they're probably regenerating glutathione, which is the, the terminal um, uh, uh, reductant for ROS scavenging in plants. And we also see that oxidized glutathione uh, is higher in the desiccation tolerant species than in the desiccation sensitive. That suggests that uh, a lot of uh, protection against ROS is occurring very actively, uh, whereas the, the, that process is very inactive in the desiccation sensitive species. The other thing we think might be going on with these uh, uh, gamma glutamine amino acids is they're involved in uh, glutathione recycling. Uh, sorry, uh, glutathione recycling, but also uh, nitrogen storage. And I'll, I'll come back to that point in a second. Uh, what else is important? Well, look at these flavonols. Uh, these are three uh, that are very structurally similar. You have neuringenin, epigenin, and luteolin. And notice these are hydroxylated, and they're thought to mitigate UV light damage uh, and protect against ROS damage of membranes in particular. Uh, and also, they're thought to uh, maintain that, uh, that uh, membrane uh, fluidity and integrity uh, in, the, in the dry state. So those are, those are having probably dual roles. We also see uh, in, uh, an increase in uh, unsaturated fatty acids in the desiccation tolerant species. This is only speculation, but this has been observed in several other resurrection plants, that these are probably involved in increasing membrane fluidity. If you can do that, the membranes have a greater uh, probability of being kept intact during uh, the desiccation uh, tolerance. Uh, and then lastly, we have a whole series of unnamed compounds that are very abundant. And uh, as I said before, the unnamed compounds are about 40 to 44 percent of the compounds in both of the species. But uh, I'm just showing sure nine here. But we have 12 <coughs> unknowns that are 5 to 120 fold more abundant in the desiccation tolerant species than in the desiccation sensitive species. This suggests that we still have a lot to learn about these, these uh, what are important. And these are very good candidates for further study. So, just to summarize uh, this first study, the uh, polyols are very important, and we think that they're very important for slowing the rate of drying or rehydration for adaptive processes, and they're also important for uh, enzyme and membrane integrity and ROS scavenging. We have aromatic amino acids and flavonols that are also important for ROS scavenging and photo protection and membrane stabilization. And we have these gamma glutamine amino, amino acids, which are important for ROS scavenging and nitrogen storage, which I'll get to. Uh, and then many unnames. Okay, so uh, how are we doing on time? Uh, we're good. We have a few more minutes? No. Yeah. Uh, uh, 5.15. Okay, I'll go, I'll go quick. Uh, so we did another study, and I won't go through all of this in detail, because uh, this is uh, also uh, in press. Uh, what we, what we did, did in this study was uh, compare going from dry to wet to dry. Okay? So that's the study, and uh, this is the box plots again. Uh, in, uh, uh, so this is what you'll be looking at. And uh, one thing I'll note, I'll note, and this is just for the desiccation tolerance species, note that the drying is slow. It takes about uh, four hours to uh, get down to about 70%, uh, 75% 70 relative uh, water loss. And then rehydration is very rapid. It's about four to five times more rapid. Okay? But uh, uh, both of these are much slower, as it turns out, about four to eight times slower than the kinetics of a desiccation sensitive species. So everything is slowed down in both directions. Uh, and so we, in this study, this completely independent study, we found 251 
uh, metabolites, 47% of, of which change significantly at one of these five hydration states. And uh, what you'll notice in this PCA plot is that these two dry states are similar to one another, and the two intermediate states are similar to one another. What's the outlier is the fully hydrated state. Those are very different from one another. And again, suggests that uh, the metabolic predisposition for this plant is to be ready for drying in either direction uh, at all times. So trialose, sucrose, and glucose uh, are, as I said, the most abundant. Uh, and uh, uh, the, uh, uh, we see an increase in the dehydration uh, of most of the uh, TCA and glycolysis gluconeogenesis compounds. And we see, um, uh, interestingly, um, where we think these sugar alcohols are very important uh, is we know they're more abundant uh, in the desiccation tolerance, but where? We, we, were, we weren't sure where. Uh, when we did this time course, it's very striking that these are most abundant in the fully hydrated state. And that was completely, uh, I really didn't expect that observation. But it makes sense because if these are involved in ROS activity, osmoprotection, and stabilization, uh, you want them to be very abundant uh, when you're going into uh, this zone of, from 100 to about 40%. Uh, you want them to be very abundant. Uh, in, that, in that zone. And you can see that a lot of them are uh, most abundant. And so, again, we think that these are probably involved in, uh, as hydration buffers to slow down water uptake and retention and all of these other previous activities that we mentioned. Uh, the other thing that's striking is that within uh, lepidophila, we see an accumulation of these nitrogen-rich amino acids glutamine, glutamate, aspartate, and asparagine. Okay? And these have an additional uh, nitrogen uh, molecule, or well, <laughs> uh, atom. And these are accumulating in the dried state in every single case. And it's thought that these are serving as nitrogen reservoirs for uh, growth and, and uh, protein synthesis uh, when the plant is revived. And this is similar to the role that I suggested earlier for these dipeptides, these gamma glutamine amino acids, uh, to rapidly mobilize when you rehydrate it uh, and resume protein synthesis as rapidly as you can. Uh, these amino acids are, and dipeptides are probably serving uh, as a rapid nitrogen reservoir for the rapid remobilization of uh, amino acid biosynthesis. Uh, and that, that's just a speculation, but we think that that's what's going on. Uh, and again, of course, they're involved in raw scavenging uh, and uh, 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 reactive oxygen protection. This accumulation of gamma glutamine amino acids is evolutionarily conserved. So this is data from a paper we published last year from Sporobolus, which is a resurrection in grass in the Oasea and the moss, which you saw earlier. And uh, here's uh, seven species and four species uh, that are conserved. And they're always accumulating in the dried state. So we think that now we have uh, three different species that we've looked at. Uh, it's all the same. They always accumulate this. We think this is a very important mechanism. And, and then we also have a lot of unnamed compounds that are more abundant in particularly at this early stage of dehydration. Okay, so uh, both uh, constitutive and inducible stress adaptive responses are important for uh, dehydration. Uh, a whole variety of responses are necessary, so it's not just one single response. We have osmotic adjustment, stabilization of enzymes and membranes uh, through osmoprotectants, UV protection, and uh, limiting damage from oxidative damage. That appears to be very, very important. However, in the desiccation-sensitive species, 
Uh, it doesn't activate these responses. It doesn't express any of these responses on a constituent matter. And the result is that it dies. OK. okay. So we have just a few more minutes. Uh, I'd like to close with this other species that we've looked at, uh, Sprawla stephianus. This is a native of South Africa. And this is, uh, again, it survives complete desiccation. Uh, and it, uh, we, the reason we're interested in this is that uh, we, work, we work in a very low water environment, as I said. It would be nice to, instead of growing alfalfa uh, that uses uh, hundreds of hundreds of, of gallons of water, uh, could we use, uh, find some other low water use, water, low water input grass? Uh, and uh, this is a very nice candidate. It has forage, it has forage characteristics which are comparable to other grasses that are currently used in Nevada. And it's desiccation uh, sensitive. So this is this, the desiccation tolerant species uh, here. And then these are the two sister groups that we compared it to. This is uh, Pyramidalis and this is Fimbriatus. And so just to show you that this is indeed a, uh, a desiccation uh, tolerant species. Uh, this is a, a little movie that my collaborator and Mel Oliver put together. So uh, and just showing you that this, this grass does indeed uh, resurrect. Uh, so there are the dried grasses uh, being misted. Uh, they had to, to mist it uh, from above to get the, the plants to be fully rehydrated. And uh, you can see uh, that it's very brown. And in contrast to Selaginella, this plant dismantles a lot of its photosynthetic apparatus. Uh, and this whole process is much slower. Uh, this is going to take about 48 hours before these plants are fully uh, resurrected. Uh, so now, we're, right when it gets bright again, we, right, coming up, right, There, there, it's about 24 hours. And these will continue to uh, get uh, greener and greener and greener. You can notice how green it's getting. Uh, it's, really, it's really quite amazing. And notice that not all of the, the leaves uh, will resurrect. The older leaves tend to die, uh, and only the, the younger leaves uh, will survive. So what we looked at uh, is uh, how often uh, does this plant need water? Uh, and so this is a dehydration curve uh, with holding water all the way out to 30 days. So this is a day 22, and the this uh, uh, the the uh, primordial species have died. This is the intermediate, and this is the uh, stephanus, and it's perfectly fine. It will survive out to about 30 days, and then when they're rewatered, we've killed both of these, and this one is uh, resurrected uh, very nicely. Uh, and if you calculate the the irrigation interval required for these species, you would have to water this grass every 10 days. Whereas with Stephanus, you would only have to water it every 24 days. And we think that uh, uh, this would dramatically reduce irrigation requirements for uh, things like turf grasses or forage grasses. And also, because you can't uh, kill it, if you forgot to water it, uh, uh, you would just uh, water it again. Uh, and it would come back to life. So it has potential as an ornamental grass, uh, which in our, we use a lot of xeriscaping in, in uh, Nevada. Uh, this would be a really nice uh, species to use for that. OK, so I think my time is up. Uh, and uh, I'll just, uh, we did do similar metabolic species, uh, comparing uh, the, uh, the uh, low, uh, the very high water, uh, relative water contents, and then we looked at a dry series. And many of the observations that I uh, uh, told you uh, about uh, uh, with the Selaginella uh, study uh, were similar. However, I'll just, I'll just zip through these. And I'll show you one final thing uh, is the uh, uh, Staphanos or, or, or uh, Stachios or Raphanos series of sugars. Uh, these are really interesting sugars that accumulate at very low water potentials, below 40%. Uh, you can see how these rise 
very dramatically, myelinositol, raffinose, stachyose, sucrose. Uh, we said already, we know that that's very important uh, in uh, malotetriose. Uh, uh, all of these are, are uh, accumulating. We think that these are important for surviving in that dried state where the, you've withdrawn all the water from the protoplasm. And what's left is called a glassy, uh, a glass, a biological glass, uh, where the sugars and probably LIA proteins uh, are, and uh, heat track proteins are uh, maintaining the integrity of membranes and enzymes to allow these plants to, these biological structures to exist in a, in a state of suspended animation uh, for months to years. Okay, so uh, I'll just I just like to end by acknowledging Mel Oliver uh, and Rob Sharp, and then the, the people who did the work in my lab are Abu Yobi, uh, who's a, a, a graduating, uh, he's, he's already graduated uh, last year. Sango Kang, who's been working on uh, some functional testing of genes from Selagamello that I didn't talk about. Uh, that are thought that are we've demonstrated and improved uh, throughout the heart. Uh, and uh, he's also been working on the transcriptomics. Alina Castano, she's done a proteomic study that I didn't have time to talk about. Uh, and uh, other several other collaborators that have helped us with various aspects of the project, including field studies. Uh, we also have a field study paper coming out uh, as well, uh, where we looked at the forage quality and productivity of these. Uh, Sporobolus species, very interesting uh, study. So we, our, our work was funded by the USDA through the Hatch program, the Nevada Agricultural Foundation, and uh, the USDA, uh, the uh, uh, US Department of Agriculture through their National Institutes of Food and Agriculture. With that, I'll take questions. Thank you, uh, Professor Fishman. Now, uh, it's open to the <coughs> question. Thank you. 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 However, I, I suspect that this quick re rehydration may be a bad strategy for surviving in desert because I suspect in the rehydration process, the plants may consume much energy, so maybe, it, in, maybe even if the plants get the water, the water is only temporary event. So if, if they get the water and the temp, they very quickly rehydrate, but the water may be only temporary, so they also need to de dehydrate. So they may be rehydrate and dehydrate and quickly and maybe consume much energy. Yeah. Is there any, is it true, correct? Uh, well, uh, I'm not sure about the energetic requirements uh, for this process. Um, uh, other than we do know that, and your, your, your uh, postulation is, spot on, it's correct, that most resurrection plants do grow slowly uh, because they are spending time making uh, a lot of mo molecules, such as osmoprotectants, that most crop plants don't waste their time on. They put all of their energy into growth. So uh, I, I didn't mention, and I think I should probably mention this at the outset, that uh, uh, Many of these resurrection plants live in very specialized ecological niches. Um, for example, Sporobolus uh, stephanus grows in uh, rock outcroppings called insilburns. I <laughs> skipped that name. Insilburns in South Africa. So very poor soil and intermittent water supply. So. They are growing in an environment where no other plants dare grow because they don't. If you don't have the resurrection trait, uh, you're not going to be able to exploit this very specialized habitat. So you're right that that this is uh, this. I think this strategy has been uh, taken up by evolved in these plants to 
to grow in these very specialized habitats. It's also, Selagina lepidophyllum grows in rocky outcrop soil where you'll have a rain event, the plant will grow for a while, it will dry again, and it will go back into a quiescent state. And that, that happens typically seasonally uh, in both environments, both in North America and in South Africa. Uh, so there is an energetic cost. Uh, the, most resurrection plants are small and slow growing. Uh, you notice the size comparison um, in the, the differences between this, these parabola species. Uh, they're quite different. Uh, look, at the, look at the size comparison. And these are not quite mature plants, but they're close. And so if I look at the biomass production difference, they, they do produce less biomass. Uh, so there is an energetic trade-off to that. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Other questions? Maybe somebody in the back. <laughs> Anybody?